My goal today is to try to connect our realities with humanity. And I'm a teacher of philosophy, and I teach an IB theory of knowledge class at the high school. And the students every year at the beginning of the, uh, of the, the semester always want to talk about reality. They're really curious about reality, and I always have one or two students that will essentially say, look, I don't really believe in my reality, and I don't believe that my reality is anything like your reality. And they'll point out, well, I've seen the matrix, and the matrix tells me that someone or something is messing with my reality, so I don't trust it at all. I just don't believe anything to be real. So I usually uh, suggest, I'll tell you what, the first time grade reports go home, I'll put an F on your grade report, and you'll see how real it is to you and your parents. And they, they pretty quickly uh, abandon denialism. But it's a fantastic question. What is my reality and what is your reality and are they anything alike? So I want to talk a little bit about the here and the now. Um, there are a lot of things that make up reality. We could certainly talk about time and space and the metaphysics of reality. We could talk about our memory and our emotions. But by and large, the two things that make up our reality and the here and the now today has to do with our sense experience, the things that I can hear, that I can taste, that I can smell, that I can touch. And that's empirical data that I take in. And that coupled with my rational faculty, my ability to use my mind to make sense of my reality, which is what we all do. And the here and the now in this TED Talk, um, we're all experiencing empirical data and we're also using our faculty of reason to make sense of it. And some of that reality is individual to myself, depending on my history and what I'm thinking about. And some of it is collective. And we share those things. But the problem with our reality, the here and the now, and the right here today at the TED Talk, is that it's fleeting. It does not have a long-lasting quality to it. So how do we get our reality to not be fleeting? For our reality to actually connect, not only over time, but connect to each other. And what it ultimately takes is meaning. There's no pervasive, long-lasting, genuine meaning in the here and the now. Now, it will be meaningful for some people that are experiencing this, certainly the organizers and some of the pres presenters. But when we scatter today, what will ultimately happen is that we all go about our separate realities. And I want to talk about connecting our reality and creating meaning in our reality. If we have meaning in our reality, our reality will sustain itself over time. We not only want but need to give our reality meaning. We desire meaning in the very fibers of our being. I usually have a student every year also that's a nihilist that says, look, I don't believe that there's any meaning or purpose in life whatsoever, which I find sad. But nonetheless, I tell the student, okay, well, I'll tell you what, how many likes do you have on social media? And I'll usually say something to the effect of, well, I have more than some, but not as many as others. So, well, at some level, that's meaningful to you. We we'll usually have a dialogue and get into a little bit more meaning, but I'm trying to prove the point that life is meaningful. And the more meaning that we can find in life, the more we can connect to one another and the more we will become related in our reality. So I want to talk about meaning and reality, the history of it. So the ancient Greeks, especially Aristotle, believed that if we found our essence, then we would find our meaning and our purpose in life. And our essence is essentially the particulars of who I am as a person. So if we do some soul searching, we find that essence, we can find our meaning. The transcendentalists argue that if we can tap into nature and genuinely understand that we relate to nature and that we connect with nature, then we will find purpose and meaning in our reality. It's a little bit difficult in today's day and age to be a full transcendentalist like Henry David Thoreau. He went to Walden Pond, spent two years, two months, two days. Um, it's not so practical, but I think it's a point well taken that we can connect with nature, and in doing so, we can find meaning in our reality. The existentialist will tell us that there's no universal meaning in our reality, that we have to find it individually. And if we can find our own individual meaning in life, then we can have a purpose-filled, meaningful life. People of faith would say, if there is a deity, or I believe in a deity, and I believe that there's spirituality, and that connects us. And I'm not here to argue any of these plausible ideas that relate to meaning and purpose in our life. But what I will say is that two of them existentialism and finding our essence are, are basically an individual journey to meaning. Whereas transcendentalism and faith are what we call transcendent realities. 
And a transcendent reality is a reality that goes beyond me and it goes beyond you, but it has the potential to connect all of us. So my question is, is there another transcendent reality that connect our realities that will create meaning and purpose for all of us in our lives? Well, from Rick and Morty, Morty seems to be kind of insightful here. For those of you that are uh, over 25, you may not know who Rick and Morty are, but Morty asks, nobody exists on purpose, nobody belongs anywhere, everybody's going to die, come watch TV. Well, I certainly hope that TV is not the transcendent reality that provides meaning and purpose in our lives. So I'd like to propose that there is one, and it's humanity. Our transcendent reality is humanity with a capital H. And I'm going to provide some examples today that hopefully will prove the point that we can tap into humanity in this transcendent reality in simple ways and in significant ways. So I've been taking students to Europe for 20 years now, and every summer we go to Europe, a group of our suburban high school students will meet up with a group of another uh, teenage group in another country, and there's an instant bond when they see one another. It's almost this organic process where these students come together, and they talk, they share stories, they swap out the social media contacts, but it's a really neat process because what, what it proves is that it doesn't matter what side of the pond we live on, we connect to one another very quickly in humanity. I believe that humanity is interconnected, it's meaningful, and it transcends all of us. Think of a time when you helped someone in humanity, not because you had to, but because you wanted to, and the state of mind that it left you in. You were probably very content and quite happy with that. That's tapping into this transcendent reality of humanity. Leo Tolstoy tells us the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. I love this picture because obviously it's an American soldier that's gone to the Middle East. He wasn't sent to the Middle East to bond with children. He was sent to the Middle East to pr make, you know, protect the people that are there. But he understands very clearly that it's important when you're in another culture to connect with everyone. And it's such a powerful image of humanity connecting to one another. So this last summer, uh, my family and I went down to Peru to hike the Inca Trail. So I wanted to go local, and I wanted to make sure that we, we went with a company out of Cusco that, that, local, that uh, hired local guides and such. And so I was in email communication with the company, and they sent back, and they said, look, we got it all figured out. We're going to need, we're going to take 18 people with you to do the Inca Trail. And it's just my family of four and a, a couple from Germany that went. So it's three to one ratio. I remember thinking, this is crazy. Because I've camped and I've hiked on six continents all over the world. I really don't need three people to pitch my tent, cook my meals for me. But in the email communication with the gentleman, he said, but this is what we want to do because we want you to come to Peru and connect with the people in Peru and be a part of what's going on here. And we only hire locals. And tourism is a great way, a simple way to connect with humanity. The other day I was watching the Australian Open, the tennis tournament, and the commentator, who was Australian, they were talking about the uh, wildfires in Australia that's just, that have been ravaging the continent. And he said, look, we're really appreciative of all the help we've gotten from all over the world. There are people that have sent, spent money, sent money. There are people that have sent supplies. We've even had firefighters go down here and fight for us. So they asked him, what does Australia need now? And he said, what we really need is for people to come to Australia come be tourists in Australia and connect with us and allow us to connect with you. And it was really insightful. This is a, a gal that I met when I was in Kenya and she was serving in the Peace Corps in Gabon. But uh, she and I went to a Maasai village and we thought we were going to go, you know, meet the adults and maybe buy some crafts and understand the culture. But what we ended up doing is just playing with the kids all day because the kids were just a blast. But um, getting to know her was was awesome because what she did was her gap year after college. She said, you know what, I want to give back to humanity and I'm going to go to Africa and I'm going to work in the Peace Corps before I start my career. Because she knew that tapping into humanity was important. Two years ago, I went to Boulder, Colorado to see the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama's speech centered entirely on the 21st generation, making the world a more compassionate place. And he kept emphasizing that what the 21st generation needs to do, you young people of today, what you need to do is to share in humanity's goals 
and make the world a better place. And he emphasized that the secret to happiness is service to others. Happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. I would argue that a cause greater than oneself is to help humanity. This is Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. And if anybody had the opportunity to give up on humanity and walk away from his situation and say that humanity is filled with evil, it's him. But he didn't. He came out of the other end and he said humanity is good and we need to help out humanity. <clears throat> Tragedies befall us all over the world all the time. There's a picture of the uh, tsunami in Southeast Asia a number of years ago and the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, Hurricane Katrina. And when the tsunami hit in Southeast Asia, I remember we were actually on Christmas holiday. I was with my family and, and we came back on the Monday with the students. I said, you know, I'm going to try something. I want to I do something, but I want to also help the kids and teach the students how to do this. So I, I challenged the kids that I had in class. I said, I'm going to challenge you guys today. Any money you donate, I'm going to match, and then we will give it to the Red Cross. And we did this with a number throughout the years I've been doing this. And, of course, I always get a student that raised his hand and said, hey, can I go home and mooch some money off my parents? Because if I can get a bunch of money, then we'll, we'll have more money. I said, all right, hold on. First of all, if you go home and you get a bunch of money from your parents and I'm matching it, I'm still on a teacher's salary and I don't really have enough money to match that much. But the other rule is, look, you have to sacrifice something yourself. If your parents are sacrificing it for you, you're not directly giving of yourself for humanity. One of the students that I remember very clearly, he was a basketball player, and he came up to me after class, said, I've got 20 bucks, McCord, and... I don't know that I want to give up that $20 because I've got to buy lunch and I've got to buy snacks before practice. I said, I can't tell you what to do, son, but I will tell you that your 20 will become 40 and it will go uh, to a good cause. So he said, what the heck, I'm going to give you the 20 bucks. The next day I came into school and he came in early before school started. And he said, I've got to tell you, yesterday was one of the best days I can ever remember. He said, I felt so good. Because I gave something that was so simple, but I got so much out of it because I felt like I was doing something for my fellow man. And it was just so neat to see this student get so much out of just donating a little bit of money. Albert Schweitzer tells us, the only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. So as a teacher, whenever I travel, I like to go to schools. It's kind of a teacher thing. So I go to schools all over the world and I visit these schools and I usually will take school supplies with me. And here's some examples. The one up at the top there is going to a Hillary school in Nepal. And uh, my buddy and I from New Zealand went and visited the school. We walked in, there was a chalkboard with no chalk and they had no paper or pens. So we hiked out for a couple days and we went to a village and we bought some supplies and brought them back. And um, what was really neat about it is that, not that they were appreciative of it, is that Sir Edmund Hillary had built these schools after he summited Everest. And he built schools and hospitals in Nepal because he wanted to give back to the people. And my point is that you don't have to be Sir Edmund Hillary. You don't have to build the school. You don't have to build the hospital to contribute. You can give money. You can give time to make the world a better place. We went in South Africa outside of Cape Town to a township. And we went to an orphanage and a school. And I thought we were going to go in, kind of participate in the lessons of the day. But all we did was hug the kids. The kids were starving for affection, and that's all they wanted. But it was a genuine experience that I hope everybody has the opportunity to do. Went to Egypt to a school, and they had no supplies. You know, I left some supplies. But um, what was fascinating about it is as I was leaving, all the kids lined up, and every kid shook my hand, which is not something that I get in the suburban high school of today. I've never had my kids line up and shake my hand every day, I can tell you. So my son and I went to a remote village this summer in Peru up the Amazon. And we went to a, a town, Ecotos, and we bought the supplies and, and took them up. And these kids got enough supplies to last them six months to a year for their school year. I think we spent 60 or $70. That's all it took. It didn't take a whole lot to supply the school. And the kids were so excited about their new supplies. They all lined up and took a picture. Except for the young gentleman here in the lower left. If you see him, he looks like he's about ready to throw his box of pencils. He's not very happy about his school supplies. He reminds me of me when I was his age. It just meant more school. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. 
If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. And if you want happiness for a lifetime, help someone. Mother Teresa reminds us that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And if you remember the examples that I've used today, they're from people all over the world, different faiths, different occupations, and different cultures. But there's one thing that they all have in common, that they all belong to this transcendent reality that connects us all and provides meaning for all of us. We need to do more living in a world beyond ourselves. Embrace it and act upon it. We can find purpose in the transcendent reality we all share in humanity. This is a picture of taking students to Auschwitz. This week was the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And it's certainly one of the locations in the world that represents what evil humanity can do. But evil didn't win. Good won, and humanity, good humanity won out. And I think this is a good message for the younger generation, is that yes, there is a lot of bad, and there is a lot of evil in humanity, but there's more good, and there's more love in humanity. I understand we live in a practical world. We can't sacrifice, a lot of us can't sacrifice everything to be a part of humanity, to help humanity. But humanity, helping humanity is a common reality for all of us. Small things go a long way. We can do small things for humanity or great things for humanity. But either way, tap into this transcendent reality that is humanity and the world will be a better place. My reality and your reality are our reality. We live in a world beyond ourselves. Go find your meaning. Thank you.